He paid for all of the sins, for all of the people, for all of time. You know, it doesn't take a double doctoral or a master's work. I'm not poking fun at anybody. Be who God created you to be, please. It always boils down to our relationship with Jesus. That, it, that relationship affects everything in our lives. God chose Israel. Our founding fathers chose God. Be a doer of the word. Because faith without works is dead, for real. That's religion, that's knowledge, that's intellect. You need to go out there and engage with your world and own your liberty. Glory to God. God is good. Let's try it again. God is good. And all the time. And the devil's bad. And all the time. He's bad the bone. The Vikings are bad, too. Lost to the Bengals last year. So I'm going to find Ohio tomorrow. I'm going to actually turn my phone off, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. If I, um, I'm going to be flying to Ohio tomorrow. I'm going to invest in Cincinnati next year because there's more bangle for the buck. <laughs> but not their baseball team. They're always in the Reds. Okay, so glad that you're here. So Pastor's been preaching on heroes, and, you know, I tell him this all the time. He knows. He gets my text messages. I said, you're my American hero. And I say that a lot. He knows that too. And he kind of rolls his eyes, but it's true. Let's give your pastor a hand. My hero. Stand up. Yep, stand up. Amen. And his wife, and his wife, wherever she is. Uh, downstairs, thank you. Okay, you be seated. If you don't like pastor, you're a moron. <laughs> write that down. Write that down. Yeah, I have a lot of moles in my yard. And uh, no, anyway, I was trying to fight that one off. It's just too low-hanging fruit. But so glad to be here. I'm going to teach on two heroes today. So I want to encourage everybody to take out a piece of paper and pen to take notes. If you don't have one, look for a neighbor with a 50-pound purse. If it's a man with a purse, he's not from this church. I'll tell you that right now. That's not the truth. So he confessed his sin. I had to confess my sin that, you know, for nine months I felt like I was trapped in a woman's body. And then I was born. Wow, that was good. I was, uh, almost got kicked out of the pulpit before I started preaching, right? Don't write that one down. Okay. Right. Uh, talk about one of my heroes, write his name down, Shamgar. How many have heard of Shamgar? Okay, two people, three, four people heard Shamgar. How many have heard a sermon on Shamgar? Well, you're going to at least learn something today, so I encourage you to take out that piece of paper and pen or your cell phone, iPad, Kindle, neighbor shirt. There's two Bible verses on Shamgar. He's found in the book of Judges, chapter 3. Judges, chapter 3, verse 31. After Ehud came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Chapter 5, looking at verse number 6. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose. I'm going to give you some nuggets of truth about Shamgar. You might want to write these down. And point number one is this. The time he lived in was dangerous. And how many know with all the defund the police, how stupid is that? It's dangerous times. It's not safe to live in Chicago without angels named Smith and Wesson. <laughs> Hunters, at one time, 2007, when we started working there a lot, uh, was San Pedro Sula was the most dangerous place on the whole planet. And God said, that's where I want you to go. Times were dangerous. How many of you ever had God start talking to you and you start ignoring him? Kind of reminds me of a guy named Jonah. He had a whale of a story. Met a guy, and he said, you know that 20% of certain girls in this ethnic group in America die or disappear by age 18, 20% in America. And I went like, oh, sounds exaggerated. So I talked to a friend of mine who's a Messianic Jew about that, and his ministry is toward that one group. And he said, no, Brother Tom, that's wrong. And I thought, yeah, that sounds wrong. It's about 40% in our country. I went, I don't know about that. So I talked to a young man in that ethnic group, just saw him two days ago. I said, well, what do you think about that? He says, 
Well, my best friend disappeared when I was in high school. One of my friends just disappeared a couple months ago. We don't know where she's, we don't know where she's at. I thought, well, okay. So then I'm in Iowa, Des Moines. A guy takes off his jacket back in January and has a T-shirt that says, 20% of all girls in a certain ethnic group die or disappear by age 18. And God begins to bother me. Uh, anybody know what group that is? Anybody want to guess? There's not that many ethnic groups. Not Hispanic, nope. Not black, nope. Not white, nope. Not Asian, nope. Native American, who got that? It's Native American. And I heard that, and I'm like, and God says, I want you to do something. So if you sing really loud, you don't have to listen. Ha, ha, la, 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 yeah. I said, I'm a little bit busy. Our budget in Honduras is over a million dollars a year. And then our safe houses, we just rescued our fourth girl in Missouri, about half a million a year. And on Wednesday, I'm, I'm going to be a daddy. I'm going to have a baby. So, yeah, how old am I? 61. But at 61, I want to be buff like Pastor Steve. When I work out of the gym at 61, I'm usually the strongest guy in the gym at 61. No kidding. Especially when I work out of curves. <laughs> I pretty much can beat out every chick. 61, yeah. And uh, my, my wife was faithful raising uh, 180 children, and at 55, God gives her her own baby. Yay. Amen. Her name, Esther Reina, Queen Esther in Spanish. And we're excited, just a couple more days, amen. So we're no longer uh, Sarah and Abraham, we're Sarah and Abra Stam. <laughs> uh, come on, amen. I'm getting excited. One of my pastor friends, he's a word of faith guy, said, are you drunk? When I first texted him about getting, having a baby, he says, are you drunk? I said, no. Are you drunk? I said, not as you suppose. <laughs> Acts chapter 2, you got to read the Bible. Anyway, <laughs> and uh, so we're pretty excited about that. And um, so I'm going like, I'm a little going to be a little bit busy. Now you want me to help out Native Americans? I'm going like, Ugh. and how many know God just keeps knocking on your heart? Yeah. So about a month ago, and we still had to wear masks in the airport. Remember, Paul was on the road to Damascus because <laughs> the science changed. Now you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to worry about socialist distancing. Yeah. It changed. You know that virus is really smart. So pray for me. I'm flying on Delta tomorrow. I hope I don't get the variant. Uh, pilot moved into my house. Great guys, my helper, just retired from Delta. He's kind of a, he's a pilot. He's kind of a plain guy. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sitting at the airport. This guy's wearing a mask. It's five in the morning. I don't talk to people that wear masks, especially when I'm wearing a mask. I hate those things. They're the devil. They're diapers. And anyway, they don't work. <laughs> and so I'm um, looking at the guy next to me. I said, are you Native American? Which you don't ask people that. You don't mean a total stranger at the airport? Are you Native American? I'm like, what are you doing? He says, I am. I went, yeah, I thought so. So where are you from? He said, I'm from Maine. Yeah, I've heard of it. That's cool. And uh, I said, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but I feel like <laughs> God wants me to start a safe house right near the Indian Reservation. You ever heard of the Red Lake Indian Reservation? He said, that's my tribe. He's sitting right next to me at the airport. He lives in Montana. He got stuck in the airport because of a snowstorm. And he's sitting right next to me, and God really begins to bother me. Yeah. I'm really trying to ignore. It's not working. Do you know how dangerous it is to work on the Indian reservation? They sell their own kids. You're breaking their financial opportunities. It's dangerous. I'm going like, I just don't know. I'm not walking in fear. I just, it's just a big step of faith and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, why don't you talk to the mega churches? I named off three or four people to help God out. You know, the big mega churches that take up five, ten million dollar offerings could write, you know, they could tithe one offering for one service and pay for the whole thing. <laughs> and then here's what the Lord spoke to me. He said, Don't get a big head. You're not my first choice. <laughs> okay? What choice am I? He said, You're about number twenty four. Which is pretty sad. That one person after they said, no, 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 no. So I prayed for a partner, and I met a guy from Kenya. He's from Kenya. And he says, I'll go 50-50 with you. Staying at our Airbnb, I'll do it. I got the money in the bank. Let's go. Can you believe it? <laughs> There's some good stuff here, friends. 
I always, every time I come here, I say, the reason why pastor has me come is I make him look so good. <laughs> we want the real preacher back next week. I get it. I get it. I heard your wife speak last night. I'm not even number two. Anyway, she's pretty good. And, um, but dangerous. Everybody say dangerous. So at our place in Missouri, just rescued our fourth girl from abuse. She'd been abused her whole life, born in Ukraine. Now she lives with us, been abused for all her life, and she's safe. But do you know how dangerous it is to have a safe house? Especially now that everybody knows where it's at because they put it in the newspaper. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not a secret anymore. But we thank God we have uh, angels named Smith and Wesson. And, and if you're a pimp and come to our place, you're going to be a pimple. Uh, actually, you're going to be a holy man. <laughs> <laughs> I love pastors like that. I trust in angels and Smith and Wesson. There you go. Anyway, Glock three times. <laughs> That's brand new. I'm going to say that again next time. But I got to make sure I'm in the right church. <laughs> I was in Washington where the sun always shines above the clouds. <laughs> you don't have to sing Our God Reigns. He does every day. I made this statement. Every time a woman buys a pair of shoes, a man gets to buy a gun. How many think that's fair? I got some women saying amen. Woo! One woman said, woo, 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 guns cost more. I said, yeah, but guns are an investment. And of course, I know what you're thinking. Shoes are investment. Absolutely. Anyway, let's keep going here. Uh, let's put the church in two. Um, but how many here don't want to live a boring life? Raising male pigs is boring. So is mining. Boring. <laughs> If there's a movie about you, what category would it fall into? The romance. Te amo mi amor. Um, drama. <laughs> Sci-fi. Um, adventure. Comedy. I just want to be a mushroom. I want to be a fun guy. I wasn't that funny, but thank you. Anyway, <laughs> or how about, how about the movie that once and for all cured insomnia? Because it was so boring. How many want to live a life of adventure? See, I told Pastor Steve he needs to write a book, The Adventures of Steve. <laughs> He's so sweet, they named it Stevia after him. Hey, that's new. That's new. Sounds like an animal in Africa. It's new. Anyway, boy, stop it. You sowed that seed and it's coming out. The point is this. God has great destiny, man. But you've got to be willing to take a risk. I hate my job. I hate my job. Well, you picked it. You know what job stands for? Just over broke. I hate my life. You chose it. Don't be putting fingers toward anybody else. If you're under 18, it's one thing. If you're over 18, you are where you're at because you chose to be there. I can't hear you. Yeah. Are you living a life of adventure? Say amen. Yeah. Well, I'm getting older now. I'm going to cut back. How many here are not cutting back? How many just getting started? Woo. Amen. How many don't want to retire? How many want to refire? Can you imagine that man ever retiring? No. Are you kidding? We're just getting going. How many can say Hallelujah. I was on a plane talking to a lady, and uh, she didn't speak English, and the flight attendant didn't speak Spanish, and I'm hungry. So I had to be the interpreter. So I was the interpreter and said, uh, ordered, help me order the meal so I could eat food. And I looked at the lady next to me and said, Yo tengo, at that time, Yo tengo 60 hijos. I have 60 children. She must have thought I looked like a gringo. I don't know why. She said, you mean you have seis hijos, six children? No. She said, tangles the saint, the eels. I have 60 children. And she gave me a dirty look. <laughs> so I don't want to leave her hanging. So I said, por diferentes madres, by different mothers. <laughs> and her look got really dirty. I, I just didn't understand. Because there's guys in Honduras that have 60 kids by different mothers. So I said, por diferentes padres, yo tengo un orfanato by different dads. I have an orphanage. And it was a hero. What I'm trying to make is this. We're not cutting back. We're just getting started. I can't hear you. Amen. I'm getting old. 
Well, duh. If you don't get old, you get dead. Right? I can't hear you. I mean, our governor, you heard of our governor from Minnesota, Tim Jong-un. He's from North Korea, Minnesota. His nickname is Dick the Tater. His kids are tater tots. He says, you're not essential. Stay home and starve. I can't let my orphans starve, so I thought about getting into roofing, but it was over my head. I really didn't want to get shingles. <laughs> but oh, I can't find a way to make money. There's so many opportunities. There's so many lazy people. If you can't make it in America, you can't make it nowhere. I can't hear you. Amen. Why do you think people from Mexico are coming here? They had to shut down the Mexican Olympics because you can run, jump, or swim. You're already in America. <laughs> Anyways, a little, little controversial there, whatever. Hey, my wife is, she's Peruvian. She speaks Mexican. Anyway, <laughs> you didn't get that one. Okay, all right, I'm going to pray for that young lady right there who's wearing my hoodie. Get up here, young lady in the blonde hair, as fast as you can before the rapture. I'm going to pray for you. I want three to five people to come stand by her. The rest of you stretch forth your hands like this. Here we go. Amen and amen. I'm over here. Thank you. All right, there you go. Father God, I pray for the great anointing on her life. That God, she would surpass kids that are 16, 17, even young people in their 20s, and be a woman of God to help lead in worship. You need to play an instrument. I saw when I was, when you guys were worshiping Pastor Steve, you need a young person's worship team with dancers and worshipers and musicians and singers. I pray God she'll lead people into the presence of God. I pray a day coming, she'll take people on mission trips. She'll say to people, you need to go on a mission trip. If I can do it, you can do it. I pray God she'll be an entrepreneur at a young age. There's a day coming, she doesn't have to ask mom and dad for money. She makes her own money. In fact, I pray she makes so much money, mom and dad ask her for money. <laughs> Amen. So God, I pray for her, God, to get a science and business and the kingdom of God. Let her know that Bible through and through in Jesus' name. Amen. Give her a hand. Amen. <laughs> See you later. And write this down. Boys are bad. Boys are bad. Write that down. Okay. Now, you know, this is the next point. This is why Pastor Steve is my hero. I want to go to his castle someday. Um, because, so, because they wouldn't fight. This is the church. Oh, we got to shut down because that's what the governor said. I'm making care. Was anybody alive in the 60s and 70s? Anybody here? Anybody remember the hippies? Whatever happened to them? We don't go by the government. We don't go by the laws. They were the most obedient people to all the lockdown stuff. I can't hear you. I thought you were freedom. Leave it thought. Leave me alone. Now, oh, we got to do what they say. Because it's the science. Well, back in February 2020, we had a guy stay with us. I'm not going to tell you what part of the world, but he's wearing a mask in February 2020. And boy, was I sick for two weeks. I had no idea. I, was, I had to have a nebulizer. Went on a mission trip. I can't remember what this church is. Some beloved church in Lena. Maybe you've heard of it. Prayed for me and I actually got better, but I could barely breathe. Oh, then it came out. Guess what part of China he was from? Wuhan. Oh, yeah. No wonder I was sick. And so my wife's a medical doctor. She did some research and found the first person who caused the virus in China. A guy named Ah Chu. China is now taking credit for the internet. Uh huh. They took. It, they said they discovered algorithms from Al Gore. Some guy named Yahoo started it. But anyways, <laughs> amen. But the church quit fighting, with the exception of guys like you. You were so rare. <laughs> oh, we got to cancel because we're gonna die. There was even a big church. Won't mention the one because you mentioned them earlier. They were gonna have a healing service and they shut it down because of COVID. I'm not going to tell you who that was, <laughs> but you mentioned his name earlier. <laughs> I didn't, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> I still respect the people, but yeah, a little controversial. Pick up another thing, like electricity didn't work. But anyway, the point is this, is that people walked in a lot of fear. And I admit, I got, for a little bit, my wife, she's a doctor. She says, make sure you wear gloves when you travel. Okay. Because you don't want to die. Okay. And remember when you couldn't touch your face? They changed that now. But back in the day when you, you couldn't touch your eyes, you're going to die for sure. 
And my eye began to itch in March, and I wasn't really thinking. And I had allergies, and I kind of scratched just, just a little bit right in there, just a little bit. You killed me. <laughs> you suicide finger. Cut the thing off. So you want to, amen. You're a sick human, but I'm glad you're saved and go to beloved because what else would I be with you? No. Anyways, uh, you know what I did, pastor? I'm embarrassed to say this, confessing my sins. I put sanitizer on my finger and shoved it in my eye. Wow. <laughs> Man, I stayed awake for a long time. But testimony is I didn't die. Of course, I'm still blind, but the point is fear. Remember the fear? She said, or in the early days, you need to, before they had to wear a mask, before they, when they admitted they, were, they didn't work, remember that, that, that doctor, Falsy? They don't work, but she said, you just put one on anyway. So I went to this place, and they had little kids back in April, went to Nebraska, and I went inside, and, you know, I forgot my gloves, so I opened the door, not like this, you know. Walked in, man full of faith, and don't touch the kids, because they could die. There's no cases in Nebraska yet, I don't want to bring it there. Walked in, kids say, puppy dog! Ugh. I just killed five kids. <laughs> but thank God the mother-in-law made me a mask. It was a dog mask. It was awesome. It's like a, it had holes in it so you could actually breathe. I love that dog mask. So I'm driving from um, Nebraska to Iowa, and I stop off at this little gas station, and I'm wearing my dog mask and gloves. This is early on. And this guy pulls up in a convertible, gets out, looks at me, and goes, ah! <laughs> drives to the other gas station because I had Illinois plates. Because, <laughs> you know, I guess we're all dying in Illinois. And uh, so I walked in. There's like 10 people in line. I got my dog mask, my gloves, and I walk in. And, oh, you can go first, sir, because they saw the Illinois plates, you know. So I walked up there, and the lady said, how you doing? I said, rough. <laughs> <laughs> but we survived. How many can say amen? amen? But you can be so proud of beloved church. If you didn't shut down, give the Lord a hand. How many glad we can actually hug nowadays? Because that virus just doesn't do that no more. I can't hear you. Such a smart virus. All right. The point I'm trying to make is this. The church has walked in fear way too long. Amen. We're afraid of offending people. Well, let me talk about a guy named Jesus. He wrote an offensive sermon. Let me quote the two points. You guys are vipers. <laughs> that went over real well. That's point number one. Point number two is your whitewash sepulchers. That went over real well, too. How many know you got people kind of angry at them once in a while? We're not here to make people mad, but we're definitely not here to compromise. Because if the church doesn't stand strong, who will stand strong? And thank God you got a man of God that's standing strong. How many can say Hallelujah. And it's easy for him to stand strong when he's got a backbone of a church that stands with him. I can't hear you. Yeah. Amen? Because yeah. if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. And they wouldn't fight back. We don't want to offend anybody. There's a little town called Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know if you've heard of it in Illinois. And then next to there's a suburb called Middleton. And years ago, some girls got, ladies got together and had what's called Jesus Lunch. And they got together at Jesus Lunch and about 400 kids were coming to Jesus Lunch, not in school, right across in the park. So it wasn't school property. Went to Chick-fil-A, got lunch, and they talked about Jesus for about five minutes. And over 400 students were coming in a very liberal, secular area. And God was moving. And then the devil got involved. Put fear in the superintendent's heart. The principal said, we better shut this down. We're going to get sued. And so the girls needed a, a, a lawyer. So a lawyer said, well, I'll do it pro bono. And so he contacted the superintendent of schools. And the principal said, uh, freedom of, of religion, uh, if you don't back off, I'm going to sue you and, and you will lose. And the big church in town, the big evangelical church in town, the pastor said, oh, don't fight back. We're Christians. We don't fight. Which is pretty typical. And uh, the lawyer said, no, oh, I'll fight. And then, of course, it got famous. He made the Madison paper. He was in the Chicago Tribune, Minneapolis Tribune. He was on CNN. He was the number one uh, story on Fox News. 
And um, the school backed down. And that lawyer was my son. Amen. And he took a stand and he fought. And he won just like you fought. You fought the governor and you won. And, and we won. How many can say hallelujah? <laughs> How many want to live in peace? But if you start the war, we're probably going to finish it. I can't hear you. I'm not talking about being violent. I'm talking about fighting with the tools we have. How many can say amen? amen. So being at peace doesn't mean you're going to be at peace. See, Ronald Reagan said, peace through strife. Not peace through, oh my gosh, we're going to lose. We need to fight back. How many can say amen? A little girl walked into the Target bathroom a couple years ago, and some big hairy man fouled her. So the dad of the little girl followed the big hairy man. The big hairy man said, well, really, I'm a woman. So the dad knocked out the guy's teeth and said, really, I'm the tooth fairy. <laughs> it might not be a true story, but it's hilarious. But the point is, <laughs> amen? amen? You mess with our girls at our safe house or our kids in Honduras, and you're going to meet the maker. How many can say hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen? I feel like I'm at an NRA rally for Jesus, hallelujah. But we got to protect people. I can't hear you. Yeah. There's a pastor in a big church in the Twin Cities, uh, not the one that we talked about earlier, but, and he said, well, I'm against guns. And somebody said, what if somebody came in to hurt your wife? Well, I would just pray. <laughs> wow, that's great. I'm glad I'm not married to you. Can you imagine somebody coming in? Oh, where's your wife? Uh, well, well, I'm a peacemaker. She's second bedroom down on the left. Here, let me show you. Wait. What kind of a man would do that? I can't hear you. How many of we need to fight against evil? Amen. How many parents have children? Oh, that's, that's a parent. That's deep. How many fight for your kids? Say amen. How many mama bears we got here? Amen. Probably from Chicago. But, um, no. Do you shake your head no there? That was a, I hurt my feeling. Fake it next time, would you please? All right, we're going to stop and pray for somebody because God's got a good word. Uh, mi hermano de Honduras, at least your family was. Uh, venga aquí, por favor. And his parents are from Honduras. And so, would you all stretch forth your hands? You want three to four people? Stand up, put a hand on his shoulder. Let's do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray for this guy. And right now, God, I pray you give him a gift of evangelist to bring many, many people into the kingdom. I see him exercising it. Maybe it's the Y or a gym, whatever, and being able to minister to some of the people he works out with. I pray God he starts his own company. Wouldn't it be cool for a Hispanic to hire white people to work for him? <laughs> <laughs> I can see it happening too. And so God, I pray he's a bunch, around a bunch of entrepreneurs, learn how to do business. That way people can work for you and you can be that witness to them and that encourager. I pray God for him to raise a godly family with godly children. We think he's a part of this fellowship. I pray one day, God, you'll ship him out somewhere to expand the ministry here some other location. In the meantime, God, use him mightily to be a mighty leader. Read every book you can by John Maxwell and be a great leader. I pray you'll be a producer. I pray you prosper him and anoint him to set people free from poverty. Saying, well, I'm poor. Well, you know what? Maybe you were poor, but you don't have to stay there. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give him a hand in Jesus' name. All right, bless you. Amen. Okay, point three. Who was his predecessor? The guy before him. Who was it? What? I can't hear you. Very good. Or Ehud. So write this down. Who's your mentor? Who's your daddy? No, sorry. Um, no. I slipped out. Who's your coach? Who's your hero? How many parents have ever warned your children, be careful of who you spend time with? Right? I come in here and hang out with a hero, amen. See, knowledge is learning from your mistakes. Wisdom is learning from somebody else's. So I pray, God, send me the right people in my path. So Honduras is the second poorest country this side of the earth. And many years ago, um, uh, remember 2008 when gas prices were 4.59 a gallon? <laughs> Wish we could go back there. 
anyway. And we were in nine building projects, are you ready, on three continents, our ministry. And we lost every donor over $100 a month. Our orphans were starving. And the Lord said, don't ever do that again. Do what? Don't ever have an orphanage without a farm. Because people cut back on giving when money's tight. I get it. But our kids still have to eat. There's no government programs in Honduras. Are you kidding? They're the problem. And so God spoke to me and said, I want you to do farming. I said, I didn't go to college to do farming. I have a BS degree. <clears throat> a Bachelor of Science. Sorry. <laughs> Shame on you. Had to take a picture when I'm saying that word. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. And I, not in agriculture. So we decided to um, um, buy some chickens, and they, they, they all died. So a friend of mine from Chicago gave me some advice on agriculture. Chicago. Agriculture. What do they know how to do there? Shoot people. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, heavy foot. I mean, whatever your name is. I don't what? Thanks for sharing, Spanky. They, maybe they're entrepreneurs. Anyway, he says, Tom, you need to buy some sheep, plant fruit trees. That's a great idea. So he bought some sheep, planted fruit trees. The sheep got out, ate the fruit trees, and ran away. It was a bad investment. I was going to tell you a joke about goats, but I'm trying to cut back. Just kidding. Um, Anyway, let's keep going here. And the, then we decided to raise corn. It, it actually grew. We were pretty excited about our corn growing. There's a kernel of truth. Hold on. And um, it grew. We were so excited. Not as excited as our neighbors because they harvested it before we did. Tom, they not only took the corn, they took the stalks. They were stalking us. Well, someone said they're from Pittsburgh. They're probably Steelers. A girl that age actually got that pun. I'm amazed. You're an amazing girl. You'll make a great wife 30 years from now, but right now, just, just hold tight. Anyway, and we failed. How many have failed at things? Raise your hand. How many are sitting next to someone that's failed? Don't raise your hand for them. <laughs> failed. But then we made a great decision. We hired an engineer. And thank you. And we went from having a failed farm to last year, my engineer said, we have a top five diverse farm in the nation of Honduras. Wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's a small country. Let me put it in perspective. Honduras has a population of Minnesota, Iowa, and the Dakotas put together to have a top five farm. What's the key? God. Yeah. And water. <laughs> Show me. Thank you. And our engineer. So it went from failing to now we feed, are you ready? With your help, because you guys are with us, 4,500 people a day protein. Now, not just corn and rice, protein. I'm not exaggerating when I say that we raised 1.3 million eggs last year. And I caught some of my hens goofing off. I said, stop the foul play. <laughs> One said a nasty word. We called it foul language. But anyway, <laughs> what I'm saying is we had a predecessor. I listened to my engineer. I didn't go to school for engineering. I didn't go to, go to school for agriculture. I went to school to preach the gospel. So write this out. You've got to be humble enough to learn from somebody else. If you didn't learn anything about finances, don't be, oh, I just don't know nothing. Learn from people that are successful. I can't hear you. Yes. You don't know how to raise kids? Hang around people that know how to raise kids. With internet, if you fail today, it's your choice because you can learn anything you need to learn. Does that make sense? Yes. So it's essential you have a coach. It's essential you have a mentor who speaks in your life. You don't know it all. How many know that's true? My dad was my math teacher one time. He taught me pi r squared. And I said, it's not true. Pi's is round. Brownies is squared. <laughs> then I got an F in English when the teacher taught on synonyms. He said, it's my favorite cereal, Toast Crunch. <laughs> anyway, who speaks in your life? There's so sharp people in this room. 
So you need to meet every single person you can. Amen? You pray for the guy with the tattoos, blue shirt, mustache, right up here before the rapture. Yeah, you, you're the one with the tattoos. I think you got tattoos on. Huh? Yeah, there you go. Saw it on your bicep. Would you all stretch forth your hands? We're going to pray for him. Three to five people come stand by him. Here you go. You ready? Read every scripture you can on success and prosperity, and you're going to walk in it in Jesus' name. God, I pray for this man to make excellent decisions. I pray for management skills. I pray, God, for this man to have leadership training. That he's not just going to attend a church. Let him be not just a believer, but you attend, beloved. God wants you to be a disciple, committed, sold out. I pray, God, to use this man to rescue people from evil. God, whether they come from prostitution or drugs or just never had a good mom and dad, that this man could be that example in Jesus' name. If you had a rough road in the past, it's okay. You're driving a Holy Spirit-filled four-by-four. Made be off-road. So thank you, God, this man. Let him rescue people. Even give his life for other people. Let him live a, a sacrificial life to make a difference in Jesus' name. He's been through challenging, sometimes horrible times, but he made it through. And he that overcomes shall inherit all things. Let him inherit great anointing and the call of God. Stretch him, stir him, let him stay focused on the path of God's righteousness. Amen and amen. You have incredible destiny, my man. Give him a hand in Jesus' name. <clears throat> How many are glad you're part of Beloved Church? Say amen. How many can't wait for Sunday? Not to watch the bears either, but anyways. Okay, who was his successor? Here you go. A girl. Some of the toughest men I know are women. I'm going to North Dakota next month where the men are men and so are the women. I'm going to Nebraska the week before where the men are men and the women are husky. Corn huskers. Big Ten. Forget it. Doesn't matter. Big Ten has 16 teams. I have no idea what that means. But the point is, is he poured into someone. So write this great quote down. You taking notes? To be successful, you got to have a successor. I can't hear you. Amen. We're getting older. One day you're not going to be here. So we're not just thinking feeding thousands of people and rescuing orphans. We plan for 20 years when I'm no longer able to work, whatever that might look like. We're planning to have ongoing income streams when my life is done. I could really kick back when I have to work so hard if I just like, when I die, I die, and good luck to somebody who takes it over. When it's worth it. But God has not put that in my heart. He says, I want you to leave something self-sustaining. So write this down. Who are you pouring into? Who's, who's your children? We had one of our orphans one time was really rebellious and got body slammed her. She got right with God and she was the most unfriendly kid. Changed because we said, if you don't change, we're going to kick you out because she was so bad. And she changed and one day my wife said to her, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? She said, I want to be a dentist. My wife said, I thought you hated school. Well, I did. I want to be a dentist. And she said, uh, one day I want to have an orphanage. My wife said, you hate the orphanage. Well, I did. But I decided I want to have an orphanage someday. My wife said, what's it going to look like? She said, better than this one. <laughs> I love the feistiness. <laughs> Go get it, girl. Because isn't the job of a coach to make your students, your athletes, your people you're training better than you? I can't hear you. Isn't it a joy when people you train pour into surpass you? How many dads remember the first time your son could outrun you? I, I ran my race with my dad one time. I beat him. He never raced again. I look back, he was really competitive. I didn't really see that back then, but let's raise again. No, it's okay. You don't want to lose, right? But that should have made him happy. I remember playing my kids in ping pong. Boy, they were not good. Seven and eight years old. What's wrong with these kids? Come on. Hit the thing back. Like, whoa, let's do something else here. I have lost my patience. But my wife's a medical doctor. She has a lot of patience. I prayed for it once, but it took too long. Uh, anyway, um. And I played my son about 10 years ago. He beat me left and right-handed. <laughs> I don't play him anymore. But the point is, 
generational curse. But the point is, is we want our kids to surpass us. How many can say amen? And God doesn't want us to be really gender biased. I can't hear you. So our ministry, we've ordained, if you didn't know this, over 800 people in 30 nations, and 40% of our ordained ministers are ladies. And we have our conferences. You've been there before. Some of the best preachers we have are the ladies. Amen? I mean, generally speaking, not maybe this church, but generally speaking, who prays more, men or women? Who usually goes to church more, men or women? Who usually, preach, who usually uh, attends church more, men or women? Who's more spiritual, men or women? And that's why the men are the pastors. But the point is, um, so you got a godly man, but there's other churches, I'm telling you, the most godly person isn't the guy who's standing behind here. I'm just telling you that right now. So God's not, you know, gender biased. In Christ, there is neither male nor, I can't hear you. Amen. So God has a great destiny for the ladies. Amen. Amen. So what is your destiny and who are you pouring into in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we got to pray for a godly woman. Why well, you turned out so good. Are you ready? I'm so sorry. I didn't know she lost her husband. Just found out before the service. We're going to pray for her. Would you all stretch forth your hands? Let's stand up out of respect for the woman of God raised. You don't have to stand up. You sit down. Put, stretch forth your hands. God, uh, I thought, what, what if my wife died before me? I mean, I wouldn't know what to do. And so, Father God, we pray for your strength to be upon her and your love and people to be extra sensitive and generous and encouraging. And they'll think, well, if you lost your husband, what would you need? That God shall never lack. Yeah, she'll miss his presence. He'll miss his, him driving the cool car. Some things you can't replace, but there's things that we can help out. Prepare to be that anointed woman of prayer. Coming before the meetings and seeking God. So easy to preach when there's already an anointing there. So thank you, Father God, for to set the captives free. Yeah, we'd love to have you come to Honduras and do the grandma thing. And love on some kids. They love you. She also knows how to go shopping too and find good deals. So God, we think that she sings. She does sing beautiful. Sing a little louder. Because God, we want to hear her beautiful voice worship God. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know she's happy for him. But God, be with her through these challenging times. In Jesus' name, amen. Give her a hand in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> okay, next key is this. Um, it's only... Two verses in the Bible that talk about him. Two verses. Wasn't a whole lot said about him, so take out your pen and paper, write down. There's only one verse in the Bible to describe you. What do you want God to write? He's not a famous person. He's kind of a nobody. I want to tell you something. God deliberately picks people that nobody would pick. I can't hear you. He picks unknown people. To do big things. He hides them. Protects them. I remember watching Fox News and this guy was sharing about standing up against this governor from Illinois. I can't remember what his last name is. JB somebody. But anyways, all of a sudden he goes from answering the questions and he preached the gospel for 90 seconds. That was the fastest interview shut down by Fox News ever. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for sharing, Mr. Okay, done. You were awesome, man. You rocked. I was like, I, was telling you, I know that guy. Google his name in this church. <laughs> he doesn't drop names, but I kind of do. Anyway, but the point is, is this, is that um, God has this great destiny. Maybe nobody knows who you are, but write this down. And you said this last night. God knows who I am. There's a place called the Sistine Chapel. Maybe you've heard of it. There's a guy that was painting the Sistine Chapel, you know, about four or five hundred years ago. He spent weeks painting an obscure corner of the Sistine Chapel that nobody could see because they have drones back then. Nobody probably ever see it. And somebody asked, why do you spend weeks, Mr. Michelangelo, in a place painting that nobody will ever see? And he said this, ready? Ah, but God will see. I can't hear you. But it comes down to it. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about anybody else. It matters what God thinks. So when you write that, you need to be proactive. You need to think, what one line, what one statement would describe who I am for the glory of God? Someone asked me, what do you want on your tombstone? I said, the pizza or the rock thing? I told my wife, if I die before you, I want you to put on it. 
and he made the world a better place. That one powerful statement, your ICV, your inner core value. What is it? There's only two verses about him, and one of them is how you talk, talk about him. But he made an impact. And that's why I love the word destiny. This church is full of people that have destiny. How many can say amen? amen. Michael, I'm just a nobody. You're, no, no, that's not true. You're a child of the living God. And Christ in me. His name in Spanish is Señor Omnipotente. The all-powerful God. Omnipotent means all-powerful, but write this down. It also means all potential God is in you. Does that make sense? So you are, write this down, unstoppable. Once you know your identity, and this church teaches identity about as good as anybody, how many can say hallelujah? hallelujah? If you fail, it's your choice in this church. Amen? All right, I'm going to pray for a guy. It says Yellowstone on his hoodie. He just looked at me. Oh, God, why did he call me out? I don't know, but we'll find out. And the lady next to you is your stand by your man. It could be a song. <laughs> Who's going to come stand by this guy? Three to five people would like to do that. No pressure. All right. How about uh, let's get the guy in the back there. There's an usher. Come on up here. Stretch forth your hands. And the pastor went up. Here we go. Does your brain ever shut up? Nope. Is he analyzing everything I'm saying? Pretty much. Does he have great destiny? Of course he does. And I pray more than anything else that you give him Philemon, which means filial, which means the love of God for other people in Jesus' name. To be able to teach, train, encourage, pour into them. How many kids end up in jail because they don't have a dad? It's a high percentage of kids who go to jail who don't have a good father. And I pray God he'd be an Abraham, a father to many nations. Even kids that are not the same ethnic group would say, now that guy is the real deal. We thank you that he's here today. We thank you that you gave him a brilliant mind to solve problems. Let him think like an engineer, but have the heart of a pastor. To love people, but help solve the things that they're going through. I pray, Father God, he never retires, except for God, more time for kingdom work in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father God, for him to be an example. God, does he have things to work on? Who doesn't? But God, I thank you. He's improving. He's getting better. And I pray you anoint him to set people free from their bondages. Let him walk in encouragement and confidence and be the best husband he can be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What do you think about that one? It's good stuff, man. Thanks for coming. Amen. This is very spiritual, but I see you're taking your wife on a really nice vacation. <laughs> not, North, not North Dakota in the wintertime. I'm from Minnesota. We pray for global warming every day. It's just not happening. It's just not happening. Okay, we keep going here. Um, number five. Shamgar's name, write this down in Hebrew, means stranger. I'm not talking about your neighbor that's stranger or your relative. I have two siblings named Ira and Tate. And how many here have ever been around somebody who's kind of strange? How many here are kind of strange? Right? And his name means stranger because, write this down, they don't know for sure if he was even Jewish. God just picked him and said, you're going to be a judge. We don't even really know anything about the guy. So what I'm saying is this. God wants to pick you and me. Maybe you weren't, don't have Jewish blood. Now, my wife, her grandfather was Jewish, which is why we're the star of David as it relates to Jewish people. I thought maybe I might be Jewish because I'm German, so I Googled my name and put Hebrew in front of it, and nothing came up. So I, I, I misspelled it to see if it might be an accident, and nothing came up. So I looked at my mother's side, and nothing came up either. And I looked at my wife and said, I'm so sorry, you married a Gentile. She said, well, you're a Christian, yeah. Well, you got adopted into the Jewish family. It's true, I'm no longer Tom Stammen, I'm Tom Stamanowski. <laughs> and my mom aside, I'm Tom Gold, Kleppy, Diamond, Platinum, Rich. Anyway, I'm excited about that, because why did God make Gentiles? Somebody has to pay retail. <laughs> Amen. 
And so God is looking to you. So write this down. Only you can do what you can do. Don't think for a moment, well, God will use somebody else. Like working with the natives. He said, you're, you're not my first choice. Other people could have done way better. But here am I, send me. God's not looking for the perfect person. He's just looking for you. There's a race marked out for you. I wish I could sing like you. I sing solo, solo. Nobody wants to hear me. Some Christians sing like little chipmunks. If you don't like worship, don't go to heaven. Remember, heaven the services last forever. Go left, south, look for the goats and have a bad eternity. So maybe you're not a great singer, but maybe you're a great mom or a great dad. Or you're like my friend Tom who does agriculture. Everybody has a gift you need to use. So one thing good about the church, if you can fog a mirror, you can be a volunteer. Well, just pretty much take anybody. I'll make it say hallelujah. He's looking to you. You may be kind of strange. Somebody asked me how I married such a pretty wife. <laughs> Blind days. And maybe you're new to the church, but God can use you. How many can say amen? Maybe you're just a new believer. You don't know the book of Genesis from the book of the Philippines. But you'll read Job and Psalms. Psalms. How do you become a president and not even know how to say Psalms? Well, because they don't read the Bible anyway. But the point I'm trying to make is God wants to use you. So take out your pen and paper, write down, best to your knowledge, what can you do for God? Go ahead and write it down. What's God called you to do? Not your neighbor. Don't look at their paper. Well, we don't have a lot of talents. It's okay. You got at least one talent. You don't get by this far in life without having something you can do. Maybe God will have you do something you're not even good at. Right? To stretch you. How many need to be stretched once in a while? Anybody here still be able to touch your toes? I can. If not, call a tow truck. All right, I'm going to pray for a young person. I'm going to let Pastor Steve, you call out any young person you want under 20. No pressure. They're starting to sweat right now. Please don't call me. Welcome, Kyle. Come on, Kyle. All right. Come on, a couple guys, stand up, or a couple ladies, put a hand on his shoulder. We're going to pray for him. Stand there, buddy. I'm going to introduce you to your new daddy. What? Spiritually, your new daddy spiritually. There you go. Turn around. All right. Mm -hmm. I like him to come to church and take notes of every sermon. Who am I preaching on today? Who's the guy I'm preaching on? Remember? It's because you didn't write it. Someday you might be preaching like, I don't have a sermon. I should have took notes during pastor sermons. So I pray God for this man to study to show himself approved unto God. I pray God he'd one day be able to work with kids. You're kind of a funny person. Give him great joy. Give him great focus and great calling. I'd like to see you work with that guy in the back, the social media guy that lost like 60 pounds there. He turned sideways. I didn't even see him. <laughs> Amen. Maybe help out in the school someday and do a little teaching. I know you're young yet, but I pray God he'll be about 10 years maturity, what his real age is. It'd be a great example to worship, praise God. Love to see a playing instrument. Maybe you can learn how to play the drums like pastor. So he'll be a mighty in the kingdom, a man of no compromise. I pray, Father God, this man will be disciplined like pastor is and exercising. We need him to be sharp and bring many young people to God. In Jesus' name, amen. So, there you go. All right. Give him a hand. Amen. And his jokes are worse than mine. And that's not a good sign. Are you picking on him, the girl next to him? I saw that. That's got to hurt. All right. Face is turning red, bro. Okay. His dad's name means poor. Let's write down the word poor. Has anybody ever been poor? Besides me. Anybody ever been embarrassingly poor? I'm from Rochester, Minnesota, the home of the Mayo Clinic or the sick people. 
My dad was a teacher, so we were kind of poor, so I had high waters when I was in junior high. People say, you waiting for a flood? I said, no, I, I'm getting taller, shorty. <laughs> Sorry that you, you didn't get taller. We lived on the highest hill in, in Rochester. Kids made fun of me. We went to the thrift store before there was a thrift store. Right? Remember, you had to have Levi's tags to be cool. So then you like pull them off people's pants and sew it on. Yeah, my mom made homemade clothes. <laughs> Take girls on dates and it was embarrassing. And then I got a bunch of kids and all of a sudden driving the ugliest car in this Word of Faith church. That was embarrassing. We used to park as far as we can, like eight miles away and walk. Because it was an ugly car. It was actually black and orange when we bought it. And by the time we got rid of it, it was mostly orange. Failed inspection three times back in the day. It was a holy car. We were, I mean, been poor. One time I had no money, so I had rice. That's all I had in the house to eat, so I fried it. I took some butter and fried the rice. Boy, that almost broke my teeth. I didn't know you had to actually boil it first. It was good roughage, though. <laughs> right? Should have found some rice aroni or something. But anyways, been there poor, right? Have you been there? Everybody make fun of you? I was... Um, in Honduras one time, and I was playing soccer, and I kind of, my shoe got stuck, and it ripped it in like half, and it'd flop when you'd walk. Remember that old cartoon? The guy would have floppy shoes, you know, and I'm walking, flop, flop. And the kid from the, in the neighborhood, super poor, wanted me, oh, look at that, oh, starts laughing at me. I mean, look at the puppies. He's laughing at me, and I'm getting PTSD. Back to junior high, I'm like, oh, I got to defend myself. Like, wait a minute, he lives in that one bedroom house falling down and we're building a city. But it was so ingrained in me, I thought poor. When I went to cemetery, I mean seminary, I used to pray, God, help me, help me get out of debt. Help me save money. And one day God said, stop praying that. Don't pray how to save money. Pray how to make more money. Oh. Duh, right? Well, I didn't know that because our Bible school, they taught against that. You don't, you don't believe in prosperity. Preachers are to be poor, and I believed with all my heart. And I was on that path until one day I started hanging around these faith people. One guy said to me one time, are you one of them faith preachers? I tried the doubting sermons and didn't get a lot out of it. Prosperity, like, oh, that's, again, that's not even in the Bible, which it's in the Bible. But, I, but I, it took a long time to get past that to stop thinking poor. I can't hear you. If I was poor, we couldn't have 85 children in Honduras, rescue girls from sex trafficking in America, and have over 110 employees worldwide, if, we're, if everybody's poor. Rethink your thinker. As a man, if he's teaching on prosperity and business, and that offends you, don't be offended. I can't hear you. I was poor. What I used to earn in a year, we give away every week. We couldn't do that if we were poor. Now, last year, you guys are part of our, our ministry. My accountant said, Tom Stammen, you gave away 99.2% of your money. That's what my accountant said. I don't know. I'm not the accountant. He's the accountant. Well, how do you do that? But God. So I'm encouraging you, stop thinking poor. Now, his dad's name also meant, write this down, a song. So write that down. Don't magnify your problem. Magnify the Lord. Don't just talk about your problem. Don't just worry about your problem. Have a song in your heart. Because a lot of times people don't have a song in their heart. And when things are getting bad, they get discouraged. They get fearful. How many ever came to church depressed, started singing, and felt great? Then you get back in the car and remember why you're depressed. <laughs> That's why I'm depressed. But there's something about singing because it gets you out of the realm of the temporal, natural, and into the heavenlies where all things are possible. I can't hear you. So the things that we're doing with the help of people like you that are, would be impossible 10 years ago, that now we're just getting started. How many can say amen? We begin to raise so many eggs, it became a problem. 
because the largest egg company in Honduras came to visit us. And they said, your eggs are too cheap, they taste too good, and you are ruining the market. Shut down. So I prayed about it. Next year, we're going to build another chicken barn. I'm going to double it, just to spite them. I mean, just to, um, to help more people. Well, maybe both. Because right. how many know we're in a battle? You don't tell me to stop feeding orphans and kids and fighting poverty, because we're just getting started. How many can say hallelujah? You need to have a warrior song in your heart. I can't hear you. A fighting song in your heart. For Native Americans to go to battle, they'd sing and stir that up. And one of my favorite Native American songs is a boy named Sue. Somebody ought to cash it in. So we're almost done here, the point I'm trying to make. Take out your pen and paper, write down what's your favorite worship song. Uh-huh. Sing some good ones today. You need to have a song. And if you can't sing good, just don't sing very loud. But you need to have a song. Amen? All right, to pray for another person, another point or two, we're going to wrap it up here. How about, um, how about the guy in the beard in the corner? I'd like to pray for the one that turned around and looked at the wall. Okay, yeah, you're the... I don't know what else to say. The one next to the wall. Just come stand by him. I tend to call more guys than girls because guys are the first ones to run out of here when it's over. So we'll, women tend to have a little bit more patience. And three, a couple more guys. I'm really glad that you're just alive because the devil wanted you dead. And it's a miracle you're still here. It's a miracle you even have faith. If, you know, if it wouldn't been for that person, people around you, you were a disaster that was happening. But you're getting better. He's getting freer. Kind of like the lady was sharing, you wouldn't recognize me five years ago. I wouldn't recognize you five years ago. Because Christ has made a difference in you. Those people you were friends with in the past, they can't even relate to you anymore. Did you get religion? Oh, I just got Jesus. Oh, well, don't ever talk to me again. But one day when they need Jesus, they're going to know who to call. It's going to be you. Amen. At times you failed, 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 and now all of a sudden, you'll be more and more blessed. Is it an easy path? No, it's difficult. But you were made for this. Dan Gable Olympic champion, once said, once you've done wrestling, everything else is easy. Once you've been through the hell you've been through, everything else is easy. So God, I thank you this man. Are you ready, guys, gals? Victorious. A winner. And sometimes people will be jealous of you, like, well, how come you blah, 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 blah. You say, you have no idea the price I paid and the price that Jesus paid to get me where I'm at today. Thank God for this lady standing next to you praying and seeking God for him. I pray God he grows, he gets anointed, and one day, are you ready to take a deep breath? I see you in front of the church talking. Because yeah. you got a testament, like, i got to share this. Because God has set you free from garbage, in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you think about that one? Is that good? Good. Amen. Okay. I'll give you two little nuggets, we'll wrap it up here. Amen. All right, here we go. He took an ox goad. Took an ox goad. The ox goad has two points here, literally two points. <laughs> an ox goad was used to poke animals. Anybody here ever re raise animals? They're kind of pokey. <laughs> Gotta encourage them just a little. You don't kill them, you just poke them in the, you know, to get them motivated. Kind of like, we need that. And so God uses the prophetic gift to poke people. How many here have? more potential than you're walking in. How many here need your pastor to poke you with a sermon once in a while? How many married men have a wife? The second Holy Spirit, second God, ox goad. Why are you looking at her all the time? To poke you. I had a car once, when you drive across the line, it beeps. It happens about every 30 seconds. Beep, 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 beep. It's kind of like my wife. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Stay between the lines. Right? And, and we need the Holy Spirit to poke us. Otherwise, we get complacent. You know, as a famous wrestler said, or uh, Flair, Ric Flair said, in order to be the best, you got to beat the best. We need to be poked into greatness. How am I going to say Amen. So write this down. Be the hero you want to see in life. 
If you want to get, become a heavyweight, you got to take the heavyweight punches. Was anybody here ever young and dumb? How about dumb and young? How about dumb and dumber? <laughs> Could have been a movie. <laughs> I worked at a health club when I was 24 years old. A guy walked in the room. His name was Scott Ledoux. I said, you Scott Ledoux? How many have heard of Scott Ledoux? You've heard of him? Anybody who did? He was a heavyweight champion. Fought for the heavyweight championship of the world. Lost to Kenny Norton. And he walked into the gym I worked at, and I looked at him and said, you're Scott Ledoux? He's in his 50s. I'm in my 20s. I said, you don't look that tough. What an idiot. And he goes, bam! And he punches me in the shoulder. Wham! How do you think I felt afterwards? No, no. No, I didn't feel nothing for about a week. I couldn't even move my arm. (laughs) But how do you think I felt on the inside? No. No. Guys, help me out here. You know. Yes! (laughs) You and I think the same. Scary for you. But anyways, um, I felt... Yes. Anybody know why? Yes, I got hit by the same hand that hit Kenny Norton, and I was standing. It was a, I didn't feel nothing, but it was kind of an interesting feeling. It's more than a feeling. Anyway, somebody from Massachusetts came up with that song. Uh, before your time, don't even laugh. Boston, thank you for sharing, Spanky. And so, you got to be willing to take some hits. I can't hear you. Why is he a hero? Because he took lots of hits. It's awesome. He was telling me some of the emails he got, like, wow, I thought I, people didn't like me. We could be even better friends now. Because here's what I tell people. You ready? You're my friend until you change your mind. Please give me a three-day notice. So we need to be poked. One of the purpose of the prophetic is not to tell you what you're doing wrong. That's why you get married. I and mean, that's why you people around you, is to poke you. And finally, the last nugget is they used it to clean the plow so you could have a better harvest. And so I'll give you the last point. I'll pray for one person. I'm going to pray for this young lady right here. Kind of went like that. Brown hair. Like that. Yep. Over here. She's the one. She rolled her eyes. It means to pick the right person. And the guy next to you is your You must have some good-looking kids. Hallelujah. Okay. (laughs) Ladies, come stand by her. Let's pray for her, and here we go. Amen. Put a hand on your bride there. Amen. She has incredible discernment. She's been studying me the whole meeting. Sorry about the bad jokes. But anyways, um, I like to see her either homeschool or help out in the school. You're a good teacher. You're a good counselor. You're very gifted. You're extremely protective over people that have been beat down. I pray one day you guys might even have a safe house around here that the church can get together and protect people. So I believe that you're very protective. You hate injustice, you hate evil, and you got a really big heart, amen? So thank you for the wisdom that she has and the compassion that many girls feel so safe around you. I'm not saying you have to adopt someday, but it wouldn't surprise me down the road after you raise your own kids. We thank you, Father God. She is dedicated and committed. I pray God give her the peace of God. I pray that you fill her with your spirit every single day, that people be inspired by their life. That kids will say, when I get married, I want a marriage like you two. In Jesus' name, amen. You're a very awesome gift. Give her a hand. Amen. And thanks for analyzing me. I appreciate that very much. (laughs) Anyway, it's pretty obvious. But anyway, (laughs) no offense. Okay. All right. Let me give you one more point. By the way, tonight's at 630. Uh, I will be here at 530 to pray for people before the meeting. And so I go like five minutes per family. So if you want to come a little bit early and get a prophetic word, I will do that before the service. A few afterwards, but mostly before, because I have to catch an early morning flight to Aha. Okay. So last point is this, is that we need to clean out the plowshares so we can have a harvest. And I'm believing for this church to have amazing harvests. Not just here in Lena or Illinois, but really to the nations. I know you go to Africa, Pakistan, right? right? Honduras. I pray you'll be able to come to Honduras. Last time we had a group. I mean, have you heard of YWAM? You've heard of YWAM? Youth without any money? Out of, out of Kansas City. <laughs> Came down and they, they do the power stuff and break bricks and stuff. And, and they had over 1,400 people get saved. It's time for harvest. How many can say hallelujah? hallelujah? But what stuff does God have to get out of your plowshares to get us 
ministering to people. How many want people to find Jesus? Amen. We don't know how long we got on this planet. Whoever thought for a moment they'd run out of baby formula? Just you couldn't abort the babies, just don't let them eat then once they're born. I mean, it's crazy. They don't do anything. Well, well we didn't know about it. I can't read people's minds. It's because you can't even read. But the point is, <laughs> sorry, I should say that. God, no, I don't need forgiveness. Uh, anyways, um, I mean, come on. And, and, and I believe God's law and all this, they don't want it to happen. This stuff, because we need to harvest, man, because the times are coming. Who knows? They're cracking down on free speech from Mary Poppins. No, not, not lady. And, um, and so we need to preach the gospel. That's why he was sharing the other day, he preached the gospel, and how many people gave their life to Jesus? Uh, last night? How much? 250. What state was that in? Yeah. Just give the Lord a hand for that. Amen. So one of my ministers is named Sean Franco. He's ranked... Uh, his all-time powerlifting record holders out of Iowa. He's one of the strongest guys in the world, number one in his weight class. And I was talking to him one day. He says, hey, how would you like to do a men's meeting? I said, I'd love to do a men's meeting. He says, at 6 o'clock in the morning. Well, maybe not that bad. <laughs> because the night before, I'm coming back from Honduras. I get home at 10.30, fly at 10.30. I have to drive four and a half hours. I'm getting an hour's sleep. I'm going, I don't know. He says, no, you will do the men's meeting. I felt led. Strongest guy in the world, sure. Have you ever done a meeting, you're so tired, you see double? Well, what do you do? Lay hands on both of them. <laughs> and so I'm kind of like, two people got saved. I'm not going to tell you what denomination they were from. And the guy that set up the meeting says, I'd like you to come speak to my football team. How many of you ever heard of a college called Morningside College? No, probably not. Won the national title, Division three, three out of four times. I said, I'd love to speak to the number one football team in the nation. And you know what it's like to speak in front of 120 football players? <laughs> you the littlest guy. <laughs> it was fun. And I preached the gospel, and I didn't hit 250. We did have 60 football players raise their arms and give their life to Jesus. There's so many arms in the air, we thought there was an eclipse of the sun. They gave their life to Jesus, and I'm pretty excited about that. And the coach says, uh, we're going to go to Honduras next year with you. Can you imagine on a mission trip, 60 football players on Delta? Wow. <laughs> I'm a football player. Going to Honduras. I don't know where it's at because I'm in college. Can you imagine that? MS-13 can come. Where's Tavin? I'm protected by God and Morningside College football team. <laughs> Good to see you laugh for the first time, funny guy. Appreciate that. The point is, there's a harvest coming. I can hear you. Because many churches haven't preached the gospel in hundreds of years in their church. And they're going to come here and hear the gospel. And if they don't come in this building, you're going to go to their place and preach the gospel. Amen? Sharpen your plows. Use the ox goad. To do, write this down, a great exploit. So write this down on your paper. What's the greatest exploit you've seen in your life? What's your story? The harvest. God used you. They that know their God, Daniel eleven thirty two, shall do great exploits. And write this down. The greatest stories in your life are yet to happen. How am I going to say hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen? amen? And amen. Want anybody to bow your head, shut your eyes, want to ask you a question? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Uh, get ready for the PowerPoint. Don't go to hell, go to heaven. Give your life to Jesus. If you need to do that, in the count of three, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can and give your life to Jesus. I'm going to give you that opportunity. Maybe you need to come back to Jesus. If you do, in the count of three, I want you to raise your hand as high as you can and give your life to Jesus. Everybody's eyes are shut, please. And you need to give your life to Jesus. Raise your hand as high as you can on the count of three. Are you ready? There's already two hands in the air. Keep them up there. I'm going to count to three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Raise your hand as high as you can and give your life to Jesus. Let me count the hands. 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 awesome people. 14 in the back. Put your hands on your heart. Everybody put your hands on your heart. Everybody pray this prayer. Everybody say, Jesus, Jesus. I, believe I believe in you. You died for me. You rose from the dead, and you're coming back. I choose this day to serve God every day for the rest of my life, because Jesus is Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Let's give those 13 people a hand for giving the heart to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. We're going to go around the world in about seven minutes and have a brand new video just came out. First time in five years. You get to see it, the first church to see it. We'll be done here in just a little bit. Uh, in Hawaii, they take little girls from Thailand and from Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, sell them into sex trafficking, and when they're done with them, they throw them in the lava pits. So we've already bought the land. We have the land flat, and we want to build the first safe house on the big island next to the beach, tap. In Peru, uh, the lawyer unfortunately got cancer, so he's been had to, on hold for two years. He's finally better, and so they're gonna build, we're going to build a four-story building Two floors will be a clinic. Top two floors will be apartments, and the apartments will pay for the doctors. Okay, so we want to be self-sustaining. Tap. Uh, Wisconsin Dells. How many have been to the Dells? So we built a 12-bedroom, 12 12-bathroom 12 house the last three years. Tap. And it is finished except for the decks. So we're already renting it out. Just rent it out to the state champion basketball team in Des Moines for the state of Iowa. And so you can come and rent there. That money is going to go to fund the orphanage. Should fund it for four to five months a year. Amen. Amen. So we even have a farmer that came. He's a farmer in the Dells. Tap. <laughs> I know Sage Beach, Missouri, uh, Lake of the Ozarks. We have 120 acres. My accountant and my contractor lives in their house. Tap. That is our first safe house. Everything is done. We just rescued our fourth girl from trafficking. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. In Missouri. And tap. Uh, on that property, 120 acres, we're building a Bible camp. We put in an old chapel. We put in a beach last year. Tap. And our counselor's house, all finished. She works full time with our girls. Tap. That building's actually done. We put up four dorms. One's finished. We need people to come and help us finish the other three. The building on the right, 6,000 square feet. It's going to be our church buildings for the camp. Tap. And here's some of our dorms. They're not done on the inside. Tap. And we put in a basketball court and RV pads. Tap. We're also putting in a store. All the cement's laid. The guy from Illinois should be putting up the building in the next week or two. We're going to put in greenhouses, and we're going to put in an orchard, and we're going to put in a little, help the girls make things to sell at the store to fund it. We also have 10 dog kennels tap. Just sold our first batch of puppies. Um, buy a puppy, save a lady. It's kind of a rough business tap. And goats tap. So our, little, our girls that we rescue work with the dogs. On um, Plover, Iowa, we're, we're taking that church and turning it into a 10-bedroom, five-bathroom safe house that's being framed, tap. We have another safe house in Missouri on Highway 63. Two bedrooms in the basement are done, and we're working on they're sheetrocking the bathroom. That will be able to hold up to eight girls in that house on 25 acres, tap. In Honduras, tap. How many here have been to Honduras with us? Raise your hand. Oh, look at that. Awesome people. In Honduras, second poorest country this side of the earth, uh, milk is uh, $8 a gallon, and people make 8 bucks a day. And so we raise all our own milk, butter, and cheese, tap. We even have black heifers. We're hoping to get chocolate milk, tap. <laughs> and we have milk machines, utterly ridiculous, tap. And these are lawnmowers, tap. <laughs> we raised last year, tap, 30,000 tilapia. They're not here. They're in school, tap. Here's our pigs. Last year, we had 300 baby pigs. This year, we bought 10 mama sows. Our goal is to have 1,000 pigs. <laughs> Tap. We're number three in our state. Number three in our state in egg production. 1.3 million eggs. Plus, we raised 10,000 meat chickens last year. Tap. We raised all our own bananas and beans. Tap for the orphanage. We're bringing in 12 more beehives. We'll be number one in the state in honey. Tap. We raised all our own corn for the tortillas and the animals. Tap. Uh, we put in a brand new greenhouse. We got uh, chilies and other vegetables in it. Tap. So we take the water from the tilapia tank, run it through the uh, greenhouse down into a pond where there's fish in it, tilapia, and then we're putting in ducks. Does anybody know the best fertilizer? 
It's duck because it's quap. <laughs> it's controversial, but anyways, I talked. Um, a year ago when you guys were there, we bought hay. Now we sell hay. We take three acres a month from the jungle and turn it into pasture tap. Our grass is called Mombasa grass. It can grow up to 10 feet tall. Uh, it's not the kind of grass that grow in uh, Illinois. That's our grass is for animals, not people. Uh, tap. <laughs> Your state's going to pot. Uh, we have, um, this is where our cows are eating next. And uh, we raise cucumbers next. And we put in over 1,000 fruit trees last year next. And so we harvested in two months 27,000 lemons. Tap. Plus, we raise lemons, oranges, guavas, mangoes, limes, papayas, bananas, and avocados. Does money grow on trees? Yes, yes it's called cash shoes. <laughs> Tap. We limes and mangoes next, thousands and thousands per month. We have our own butcher shop, butcher all our own meat. We're not vegan, sorry. Tap. Um, when our boys graduate, give them an option. College, we have five boys in college, and some are working in the construction, furniture making, or welding. Tap. Some of our graduate girls are in college. We have two. And three came back to work for us as cooks and nannies. So we have a little shopping center, and we play pickleball tap. Um, here's our teen dorms next, and here's our, little, our, our boys' dorms next, and our little girls' dorms next. We are building the biggest orphanage in Honduras. All the windows are in. We just need about 100 grand for the electric to come in. Tap. Um, here's our office buildings for the workers next. And that wrestling mat is from Iowa next. We have our own uh, weight gym. How many have heard of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes? So the number one guy out of North, North and South America came to our place before COVID. Tap. We have two soccer fields. We get a kick out of it. Next. Pray for Honduras. Major spike in Honduras. It's in volleyball. Tap. Here's our medical clinic. Tap. We're the only one for 25,000 people. Our chapel in the mountains. When it's 30 below here, it's 80 there. Tap. Pray about it. We have our own mechanical shop. Next. Fix all our own vehicles. We have a grocery store, we have a restaurant, and a bakery. We've created, are you ready, over 100 full-time jobs. So in 25,000 people, we're the number one employer. That's where your money goes to hire people. Tap. Uh, we have apartments for poor people next to work at our place. How's the hotel, Pastor? How many been to other countries? <laughs> so ours actually is a 4.9-star hotel. It's actually too nice for Christians. We don't really recommend you stay there because you need a real mission trip experience so you can sleep next to the pigs. Tap. This is our what? <laughs> Baptismal tank. Very good, Pastor. You get sprinkled, dunked, or water slided. <laughs> Tap. How many heard of Gaga Ball? Started by a lady. So guess who won the first Gaga Ball game in the history of Honduras Gaga Ball? That was me. I beat out the nine-year-old girls. It was a great game. <laughs> they didn't know the rules, but they learned as I got them out. Tap. We sponsored Olympics for Orphans uh, two years ago before COVID. Tap. And here's our kids playing sports next. Um, somebody donated 50 pairs of rollerblades from Milwaukee. First week, one broken leg, one broken arm, but, but they're getting better. <laughs> some, some people call them holy rollers. We really need your healing team down there. Save me a lot of money. Tap. We have our own school. Tap. Shut down for two years by the government. It is now open in February. Let's give the Lord a hand for that. Amen. <laughs> Um, we're building five classrooms for college. We teach the Bible, medical, and um, um, agriculture, business, and computers. Tap. Here's our welding college. We put in the plumbing. First kid that signed up, his name is Elder, and he wants to be a welder. He's Elder the Welder. Tap. Here's our kids getting ready for school. Tap. And they love school. Tap. And they love the art room. Next. And they have, we have over 100 instruments. In fact, a teacher from Illinois won Teacher of the Year in 2020. He stood before your Congress and said, I help an orphanage in Honduras. Tap. Kind of cool. No video games allowed. They play chess. Tap. Our cow barns, the roofs are going up. It'll be the seventh largest barn for cattle in our state. Tap. Our church building's going up. I think you guys helped us last year. Remember that? Yeah. So you guys will preach at the church. The walls are going up. Tap. This is our agricultural dorms for our college. It'll be done in June. We'll build another one. Tap. Um, our sewage system is almost finished. What a waste. Tap. Here's our, where some of our workers live. We have farmhouses next. Here's our pig farmer next. Here's our missionary house next. We're almost done with the second missionary house next. And our kitchen's finally done. 
And it is, and it is nice. Tap. How many like to work in a room with 150 kids for lunch? No volunteers. Next. We have our own cook's apartments and our art and music rooms. Next. And that basketball court uh, built by a guy named Kunis Otto. If you've heard of them, they're all over Illinois. And so he built our basketball court. Tap. Uh, two of our boys we had since they were three. They're now in college uh, up in the big city. Next. They're en becoming engineers. Here's our 72 kids. Tap. And we brought in 23 new kids. Tap. Give the Lord a hand for those 23 new kids. <laughs> tap. We have a Lego room next for the kids to play. That's my wife, Dr. Teresa, soon to be Mother Teresa. Three, two and a half days, tap. The guy on the right needs prayer and counseling. Is there any hope? We don't really think so. Uh, tap. Here's what our place looked like in 08. And God said, I want you to build me a city. Tap. And there it is. Amen. All right. We're going to show you a four-minute video, and we're going to wrap it up. So why don't you go ahead and pull that video up. It's brand new. None of you have seen it. just came out two days ago. So here's our video. IMI in Honduras is building a self-sustaining city wrapped around an orphanage. We've had uh, 17 calls from 17 nations saying, how do you build a self-sustaining Christian community? Because it's either not been done for 100 years or it's very rarely done. Back in 2011, I was walking our little mountain and God spoke to me and said, I want you to build me a city. My heart is to see children that they are, they go not only just finish high school, but they I would like them to see going to college, graduate and get their masters. And right now we are building our uh, high school slash college. And we're building two colleges, one for welding and, and the other one will be for agriculture <coughs> and nursing and computers, pastoring in business in, in different areas that we can uh, have our kids uh, graduate and find good jobs and also be the ones that will run one day this city because we want to have people that they are well educated and they have the heart of God to do something greater for their country and for God. came down here and we were looking to buy land to maybe start an orphanage because I heard that they were taking kids and selling them into sex trafficking. And that broke my heart. I heard about it, but back in 2004 or five, nobody talked about it. So I came here and went to the garbage dumps. I saw kids eating garbage. Yeah. A story back in the day in our first orphanage is we made, I ate, took 80 chickens and butchered them and fed them to the people, we fed probably a thousand people. And they let the chickens sit in bags for about three days in black bags. We put them on the truck and one of the bags opened up and we almost all threw up, it was so horribly smelly. Went to the garbage dump and, and you didn't want to touch the bags, you just kicked the bags off the truck. And we were holding our, our nose so we wouldn't vomit and little kids came running and what made us vomit, they just ate right out of the bag. They reached in and started eating whatever scraps they could eat and then came back to the garbage dump and an attorney said, see those little girls out there, if they don't find food to eat, 
they're going to be prostitutes at night. And that ruined my life. My wife and I, we could have retired 10 years ago. And we could have, stopped, we could have lived the easy life. But we gave up really everything we have to help rescue kids and give them a good place to live. So the story isn't just orphans, that's the backbone, but it's creating jobs. It's changing people's destiny. Now please receive the blessing that the Father has for you. He calls you beloved, the ones that are greatly loved. And we, he and I both desire that you experience prosperity and his type of divine health. And the way this happens is by allowing your soul to prosper through intimacy with him and knowledge of his word. I love you and I'll see you again soon.